Okay, so, uh, so in the uh, last class we uh, had a discussion on uh, the reasons for uh, uh, why uh, in, 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 in superconductors electrons might like to pair. Uh, essentially it's a game of energy uh, and uh, we see they can uh, very mysteriously almost, uh, you know, if they gain some kinetic energy, uh, they uh, stand to be able to lower their potential energy um, by pairing. And uh, for the small window within which superconductivity exists, this lowering of potential energy wins over, uh, you know, the loss in kinetic, or you know, the energy price you have to pay with kinetic energy. It's, that's very interesting. And uh, we uh, were able to calculate using just two particles uh, uh, on a surface, on the Fermi surface, why, uh, what is the uh, estimated lowering of energy? And that's related to the by frequency and density of states and such things that we talked about. And if we estimate it, uh, it gives you about 20 or 30 Kelvin max, not much more, based on most metals. So this is these are traditional BCS sort of superconductors. Uh, yeah, Matt, you had a question. Yeah, I, I was kind of like a general question. Should we think of the electrons is like pairing and then staying paired for a very long time, or is it kind of a transient phenomenon where like yeah. pairs like swap electrons? And that yeah. kind of stuff? It's a very good question. In fact, uh, the second uh, part is more correct, okay. meaning uh, uh, anything we try to do with electrons where we label them that, well, uh, this is the electron responsible for such things, that it's, they're indistinguishable particles. There's no way one can have a particular label with one particular electron. And so yeah, they're indistinguishable in that sense. And that uh, picture will be, uh, or is uh, uh, presented by the full BCS theory. Mm -hmm. And that's something we uh, had just started talking about you know, in the last class. So, and we'll, we'll do that today. So uh, indeed, it's a, a collect collective uh, state. Uh, and uh, what we did here was and this is Cooper's paper from uh, just which which was the breakthrough in in realizing uh, or in building the the theor uh, pairing theory for BCS theory. So, uh, right. So we were just getting started on uh, uh, or, or we did. I, I said that I will discuss this, but not in too much detail. Uh, I have given you one problem, and you can work through a little bit uh, of the uh, steps. Uh, it's uh, essentially. Uh, the, the language here is indeed in the second quantization or the creation op uh, op uh, annihilation operator formalism. And uh, we have already justified why this is the Hamiltonian with uh, the simplest Hamiltonian with the pairing, right? Uh, so you have uh, the, f you know, if an orbital k or, or state k is occupied, uh, these are normal fermion creation and annihilation operators. So this is the number operator, right? How many electrons are in the orbital with the energy E naught k? And this is your pairing uh, with uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the phonon exchange picture, right? So the lowering of energy because of annihilation of states k and minus k and scatter into you know, q and minus q, right? Uh, the lowering is minus v naught. And we saw why uh, the, the assumption in the, in the model is that it doesn't depend on q and k, it's a constant lowering. For, for, it's of the order of one milli electron volt. That, that was the, uh, and now uh, uh, essentially, if we look at this Hamiltonian, um, this is uh, this is the exactly solved part. Meaning, you know all the energies, in the band structure of the normal metal or a two by two Hamiltonian, whatever you build, you know that band structure. Now, this is the interaction or correlation term, and uh, uh, this is in second power of creation and annihilation operators, and this is in the fourth power. Uh, and fourth power means essentially uh, that it's a, uh, uh, well, okay, so a second power, uh, this is an analogous to, uh, actually this problem can be mapped into, uh, if you have a, a Hamiltonian which is, you know, a P square by 2M plus V of X, okay, and uh, if V of X is uh, something like a half M omega square X squared, second power, that's the harmonic oscillator and that's exactly solvable, right? So, and, and uh, in fact, that's where this creation annihilation operators kind of came from in the first place. Uh, but if I add uh, uh, any higher order terms like x cubed 
or x fourth, uh, this is not what you call analytically solvable. And uh, uh, in fact, it is, uh, you can do perturbation theory sort of things. So you can approximate these things. And that's the game of BCS as well. You know? so, so there's a, uh, uh, f well, the first part of it is, is uh, you know, remember what we are trying to do is find the energy eigenvalues of the system now, right? But now uh, what I'm trying to uh, point out is uh, this is analogous really to in second quantization, it becomes the creation annihilation operators, you know, the, the x becomes operator. So that, that's, and so now it becomes fourth power, which means now we don't have, you know, x squared plus x fourth. We don't have analytical solutions for this, and that's the problem. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, the k's in this are k's from an observer. They're not crystal momentum k's, right? These are actually crystal momentum. They are crystal momentum. They are crystal momentum. So the picture being, uh, you know, the k uh, up spin. Yeah, right. This is crystal momentum. And uh, this goes into q and uh, up. And so it's a, actually a, also a good question you're asking, uh, because uh, uh, in, uh, let me just write that down here. Yeah. Uh, minus q and this, OK. Yeah. So uh, in, um, uh, yeah, I'll come to that, but it is the crystal momentum. So actually, what I wanted to kind of say is there is a, uh, in the superconductivity, this is what's called, you know, Galilean invariance, meaning if there's a constant current flowing in a superconductor, and if you are an observer and you're moving with the current, there's no current flowing for you, right? Uh, right? And, uh, and that's true. I mean, basically, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll point something out about it later, you know, so yeah. Uh, and, and so you can imagine there's, if, if, if I'm an observer and there's a current flowing, then I feel a magnetic field, right? Because there's a, a flowing current produces a magnetic field. But, but if I'm moving with a constant velocity with the current that's flowing with the, you know, electrons, whatever they're flowing, then there's no current flowing, so I shouldn't express a magnetic field, right? And that is actually correct. Uh, but physically, what, what happens is it produces an electric field now. You know, uh, this is just charge that's, it's a line charge now. So electric field and magnetic field are two sides of the same coin. And this is Einstein's great discovery, right? The relativity kind of says that depends on what you call electric and magnetic field is really dependent on the observer. We'll have to deal with it very soon, uh, but I, okay, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. <coughs> uh, so this is the process, and uh, 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 so basically uh, the main idea uh, of uh, 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 you know trying to create uh, particles, uh, Cooper pair particles. So now that we have understood that with, because of pairing, uh, the system can lower its energy, we can try to uh, write that uh, uh, the let's say this is our uh, uh, you know, uh, normal metal state with uh, all states filled till the Fermi surface, okay? And uh, all states above it are empty. Uh, and this is our EF right? in the K space. And uh, uh, so that, that is what we are going to call as uh, our state zero. You know, state zero effectively is, if I look at the orbitals, you know, uh, then uh, I have states above the Fermi, or uh, Fermi surface are empty, and all the way till the, uh, you know, uh, till the uh, maximum k are occupied. So that's our occupation number picture of the state, and that's what we're calling as a zero. You know? It's not like there are no particles. There are 10 to about 22 particles, but they're all in the Fermi sphere. You know? Okay, so now uh, uh, to create a uh, Cooper pair, out of that, uh, we uh, uh, want to, uh, and, and we have already discussed as to why the Cooper pairs uh, would like to have opposite momenta and spin. So we can write down uh, that uh, uh, if on, on this Fermi sphere I apply, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, in the correct order I'm going to write it this way, minus k down dagger and plus k up dagger. So these are the two creation operators in this orbital with the spin, this orbital, the opposite spins and opposite momenta. This is a singlet state that acts on the 
uh, ground state, then I've created, I put these two particles on the Fermi surface and at, at this case, you know. The so case must be very close to the KF within a Debye energy. So that's one state. Uh, uh, and uh, that's an excitosis. That basically a Cooper pair. Uh, let me see. There's a, a picture. Uh, right. And, um, and it, so that's one possible state that's saying there's a Cooper pair that's state that's possible, which is occupied. Uh, and I can say that, uh, uh, as you know, in quantum mechanics, any state there is an amplitude associated with the probability of occupation, right? You know, if you have a state, uh, then uh, this is an allowed quantum mechanical state. Whether there is a Cooper pair or not in this in this allowed st state, this amplitude square will tell you the probability that is there or not. So. I can have uh, a superposition of the two states. Uh, this is a combined state which says I can have either, you know, u, u sub k, the state, you know, uh, that it's, there are no Cooper pairs plus v of k that there's one, just one, right? Uh, like that, right? And that uh, uh, is essentially uh, plus u of k plus v of k. Uh, times, and if you remember this one, this is something we had defined as B K dagger uh, in an uh, early assignment where you work through this. This is a combination of two fermion operators. We just define it. This doesn't mean it's a bosonic operator. In fact, it's close, but not quite. You know? uh, but it's just a combination of two uh, times you know, B K dagger acting on zero. Is a is just a new state. We have you know there's no physical meaning yet. We're just saying this is a possible potentially allowed state for the. Uh, now um, that's one k, uh, you know one combination of k and minus k. I can have another you know, uh, like here. So let's call it k one. K one, acting on that. Right? I can have create another such Cooper pair. I can create third one and so on. Can create, you know, uh, out of the n electrons available, I can create n by 2 combinations of these. And the total wave function, one possibility of the total wave function is, if you look at this, uh, all I need to do is apply this operator again with a different orbital number, right? and again, and again, and so on. Right? So, uh, so I can, you can see that uh, I can write it as v of k times this creation thing. So acting, everything is acting on 0, but then there's a product, this k1, k2, k3, and so on. So I write it as a big, you know, a product of over all k. So this is just a construction uh, of an operator. And this is really what uh, you know, Schreifer did. This is his uh, uh, trial wave function saying that uh, can we uh, use this sort of a wave function on this Hamiltonian and see whether it's giving us the properties of the superconductor. Right? Uh, so because you know, so if you have the Hamiltonian and you have a wave function that is correct, you know, essentially correct, uh, it captures the physics of the system, then when you apply that Hamiltonian on whatever wave function you have created, it should give you the physical properties of the system. Right? Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, and and uh, uh, and they tried, and in fact, it gave pretty much every property of the superconductor, like the gap, uh, you know, the TC, temperature dependence of gap, uh, Meissner effect, everything. You know? so, so it kind of gives the, all, all of that. And, and uh, uh, okay, so, so in pictures, uh, I, I took this from a book, a uh, nice book, Van Duzer and Turner, but it's focused on superconductivity. So, right, I mean, no. This is your zero state, then you apply this once, and you get one pair, two pairs, three pairs, and, and so on. And then finally, you have your full blown. Uh, and then you can see that you know, uh, this has many, many, many terms, you know, 10 to the power some large number term of terms. Uh, but they are in a very interesting order now. Uh, in fact, if you uh, try to normalize it, uh, uh, remember what we have, uh, we, we do not know yet are these two coefficients. No? What is u k of v of k? These are the two uh, coefficients that we have left unknown, and we will have to find what they are, such that the Hamiltonian gives you, you know, uh, 
first of all, uh, what they have found that this is, this gives you eigenvalue, meaning it 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 it, it uh, is a solution for that BCS Hamiltonian, right? And once you get the eigenvalues, uh, you can minimize the energy and find out what are UK and VK. You know, that's that's a variational method. Or there is another method due to Bogolyubov and others, which is doesn't allow uh, uh, you know request doesn't require you to minimize anything. It gives you the solution in you know uh, with, with in a nice way. I'll just point it out. And uh, I have asked you in the assignment to kind of finish some of these steps, right? So you can work through some of these steps. Uh, Right, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. So alpha uh, here. Uh, so uh, if you look at this term, you know, just this linear combination. This is not the full basis. This is just one pair. You know. If you look at this term here, uh, what you notice is, you know, this operator uh, has this property that it it actually, uh, if you take it twice, it goes to zero. You try to create two fermions in the same orbital, it just goes to zero, right? Or exclusion principle. So uh, so this is in the form of one plus, uh, or rather, you know, uk plus vk times b of k dagger, right? This uh, whole uh, object here that's acting on the ground state or the, uh, uh, and you can kind of think of this as really uk plus V, I think I'm, maybe it's a little confusing how it's written, plus BK squared and so on. But all of these terms are zero. So this is a, and you can write it as E to the power some constant, you know, E to the power alpha times this operator because the, the expansion of E to the power, E to the power alpha times whatever is sitting here is exactly equal to one plus, you know, that alpha times that plus square, right, over 2 factorial plus so on. This is exact. No matter whether x is large or small, this is always exact, if you retain all the terms. Right? And just that, because these are fermions, this is 0, and everything following is just 0. So alpha is just a coefficient for the kth orbital, which is related to your u, k, and v, k. And you can write it, and in fact, you can get the analytical expression for it. The reason uh, I kind of included this here is because this particular object, you know, e to the power uh, uh, creation or an annihilation operator acting on a ground state, if it gives you an allowed state of the system, these quantum states are called coherent states. They are very interesting states in uh, quantum mechanics, hard to typically you know, create, but uh, these are called coherent states. Uh, there are some very interesting properties, and the BCS state is indeed a coherent state, you know, and, and uh, that is just pointing that out. And I, I'm not trying to kind of go too far into that direction at this point, except this is the reason it's written that way. You know. But we don't need to that for our further arguments at this point. You know. <coughs> okay, so uh, if I take this uh, BCS uh, wave function and I try to normalize it, uh, you can think of this now as being normalized uh, for each k orbital separately. You know, there are many of them, but uh, so you can see that uh, it will look. Uh, one of the terms, for example, might look like u k star plus v k star. You know, b k. This is the operator, so it becomes just that, and u k plus v k, v k dagger acting on zero that whole thing should be equal to 1. And uh, so from here, uh, you can see that this and this, and that and that, those two terms will give you uk squared plus vk squared, right? Uh, oh, sorry, uk squared plus vk squared times uh, bk k dagger, right? And uh, and the other terms have only one of this or that, you know, not two, right? So if I have only one, then you have you know you have modified this state, you have uh, rearranged some states here, moved you know created put some particles here, but that state is orthogonal to that state now, so those terms just go away, right? Only things that's left is just that, you know, okay? 
And in fact, uh, you can also show from your you know, earlier assignment uh, that uh, this has uh, the property that it uh, is, uh, has a, a boson-like property that uh, BK, BK dagger, the you know, commutator, BK, BK dagger minus BK dagger, BK is equal to 1 if these two orbitals are the same and they are the same, k and k are the same. If they are different, then you will have something else here, which is what makes them non-bosonic. Okay, so, uh, so essentially from here, what you will get is uh, when you act with this, this will just give you 1. You, know? you can work that out. I've asked you to do that in the assignment, just one, in one step, just using that here. And that will just become, this equation will become just that. You know? So that's one condition on your unknown coefficients u and v, right, right here. And probably it could have been said from the beginning. It's just that this is true for every one of those 10 to the power 20, 20 some k's you know, that, that are forming pairs, every one of them. And uh, in fact, uh, without any loss of generality, uh, we can assume them to be real numbers. You don't have to assume them to be complex numbers. So star and you know, non-star are equal. And, 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 and so that uh, that's, can be proven later, but you can assume them to be real numbers. In which case, uh, uh, it's saying that, you know, if v, or in other words, vk squared for all orbitals is equal to 1 minus uk squared. And you can really use it uh, for, for many things that follow here. Right? So you really have one unknown now. In some sense. And this vk squared is the probability of occupation of a Cooper pair. No problem. OK, so uh, now uh, uh, what we can do is uh, take this uh, wave function and you know, essentially introduce it into the full-blown BCS Hamiltonian. And then when you do that, you will get something in terms of these two you know, u and v k's, right? Because that's, that's what your wave function is composed of now. And you get this sort of quantity. You have two times the free electron orbital energies times v k squared, which is, you know, what we did, minus this product of UKs and VKs here. And you also know that V and U are related through this relation here, right? So you really have one unknown now. Right? So you take that, and that's your energy. You minimize it with respect to that unknown. Right? D by D, that unknown is equal to 0, or you know, any other fancy ways you want. Sometimes this is said to be sine theta k, cosine theta k. You have theta k is one unknown. Either way, you know, whichever way you want to do it. And then you recover from there. Here are the square of the VKs, or the coefficients. And this, in, this is in terms of some things which are very physical now right, uh, of the system, of, of, of uh, something that represents the system. And UK is accordingly like that. And here, uh, what we'll get is this term that o appears here will be a combination of these lowering pairing potential and these you know, UKs and VKs are some of that. And that will give you exactly a very similar looking equation that you got in your single particle, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Cooper problem. Except now, it is a very different beast because it has every orbital, every po possible pair in it. Or everything is combined now. It's not just one state. It's, so what we did earlier was for only one Cooper pair. And now this is the macroscopic Cooper pair. The wave function has everything now product of every possible Cooper pair. And so, you, but the equation looks very similar. It's just, you know, there's a square root here. There was no square root in, sorry, <laughs> there was no square root in the original version. But here you get a uh, square root. Uh, and uh, uh, regardless, you can sum it over again and use the same tricks as we did earlier, and you'll get a very similar looking gap. This delta is the superconducting gap now. <laughs> And so VK squared is the probability of occupation. And I talked a little bit earlier uh, in the last class that if you plot this quantity, the probability of a Cooper pair occupation, it depends on the you know, energy with respect to the Fermi energy. And even at 0 Kelvin, it has this, feature, this shape, even at you know, the lowest temperatures. It looks deceptively like a Fermi function, but it's not a Fermi function. It looks very much like one, but it is not because it is a hybrid of electrons or w and, and lattice vibrations or fermions, or bosons. It's a hybrid of bosons and fermions. And so it's not quite uh, a fermion. 
And uh, the Fermi function was plotted here at different temperatures. So, uh, uh, and where you can sum over the Cooper pair energies and integrate over this whole thing, you find the energy of the Cooper pair uh, condensate. I mean, this, all the Cooper pairs. If you consider them to be free electrons and no pairing, then you sum over the energies of the you know dashed lines occupation. That's the normal metal energy. And clearly, when you go below the critical temperature, there's a transition. There's a lowering of uh, the energy because of the formation of the pairs. You know. And that you can also calculate in a, uh, uh, so if you have N0 number of, you know, uh, th that's the density of states uh, and uh, delta is the gap, then your total difference in energy between the superconducting state minus the normal metal state is equal to minus that, meaning superconductor is lower in energy than the normal metal by this much. Delta is the gap, and this is called the condensation energy that you can get in two steps from here. So it's, it's sum over all energies, and you're going to do that. I'm not. Try, I'm outlining it, uh, the process for it, you know. and this is the reason why <coughs> there's a phase transition from a metal to a superconductor because the t total lowering of total energy of the system. So, okay. And the expressions are very similar to what we had earlier. Uh, it's just that now you are dealing with this full many-body wave function. So. Okay, good. Uh, uh, there are some, uh, uh, so if you, uh, when you're working through it, if you need, uh, uh, I have the material that's posted already talks about it, especially if you look at, uh, you know, Leon Cooper's uh, article and also Schreifer's articles, they really explain it very nicely in their short articles. Uh, but uh, if you want, if you run into some, problems with going through the steps, let me know. I can give you some more reading material. I mean, there are also nice books on it. But yeah. uh, OK, so um, the uh, second approach is uh, where you don't need to minimize anything. Yeah, this is kind of a very clever approach, too. Uh, this is due to uh, um, uh, right, right after, uh, so, so in, the, in the BCS theory, they did this energy minimization. It was a variational approach. Uh, whereas here, this is a very uh, interesting uh, play on operators. Uh, so what uh, they, uh, so this is due to uh, uh, Bogolyubov and Valatin. They, you know, about a year after the BCS paper, they're able to identify this very interesting property. What they said is, look, uh, 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 in, in the uh, full BCS Hamiltonian, uh, you have a sum over all you know k's and sigmas and, and zero value uh, the uh, occupation functions let's say c k dagger c k that's just the normal part and then the interaction part is uh, uh, this uh, whole uh, you know four operator uh, thing right where you have k up minus k down minus q down and minus q up and then no, this whole combination right so and uh, uh what 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 they they realized and in fact you know uh, that that if i use some physical argument to convert this fourth order operator you know uh, to a second order which is called a bilinear form any combination and if i can convert it from four, you know, fourth power operators to something which is actually second power, then I'm done because anything second power I can re rearrange the operators, and then I have a harmonic oscillator again, right? and I can exactly solve the problem again. Right? So that's their approach, and uh, uh, this is called, sometimes called a canonical approach because it works for everything. You don't have to, you know, um, but then your operators uh, uh, look slightly different, and this is, you know, why they're called quasi particles now. Uh, so the trick they use really is uh, the physical argument they have used is is uh, also a very interesting argument and it only works because you have a lot of Cooper pairs. If you have a very small number of Cooper pairs, it will be a problem. This will not work. So there's a this is that's why it's a really a many particle effect. If you had only five Cooper pairs, this is not going to work. You know? And and the, what are they arguing here? Is look uh, so I have these operators. You look at them. They are you know. Uh, of this form, let's just look at this one. I'm creating two. Uh, I'm creating a Cooper pair. This is a Cooper pair creation operator. Okay. Now look at that and say that. Uh, look, if uh, I know that uh, I have a large number of Cooper pairs, like ten to the power twenty or something like that, right? 
Now, uh, uh, so that's the number of states. First of all, if all of if I say that uh, on an you know there are always fluctuations of the, around this number. Co pairs have been created or destroyed in particular orbitals, so it may go 10 to the power 20 plus 5, 10 to the power 20 minus 10. It's a very large number and small fluctuations around it. You know. So they said that look, uh, I, I can take you know any orbital operator and say that I, I know there's a Obviously, there are fluctuations, but it's fluctuations around a very large number. Right? So I'm going to uh, assume the operator here to be replaced by the number instead of the operator itself. Okay. Now, if you do it for both, then, th th then that's not quite right, because you just have lowered the energy of the whole system by DC, by everything. You know? Do you know what I mean? So if I just take a number of that and a number of that, then I have not done any new physics. I just have the standard energy. I just lowered all the energies. It's not going to be able to explain anything about superconductivity at all. Why is there phase transition? So they did by you know uh, by uh, choosing two terms here and two terms there, for example, and say that this is the number average or, uh, of of uh, one operator, and that that way you are able to you know reduce the x four. So what you are doing really is kind of a Taylor expansion of a fourth power thing around its. DC sort of value and reducing it to the second power thing. Does that make sense? I mean, that's really what they're doing here. And once you do that, uh, your operator, you know, you replace these, and uh, what you realize is this number of Cooper pairs is directly related to the gap of the system. You know, you can redefine it this way. This is just a constant now, delta and delta star are constants. And you have rewritten it in terms of CK daggers and CKs now, except now it's completely a bilinear form, meaning second power. And now, by redefining you know, uh, operators this way, you can write CK is a new operator, gamma, and a gamma dagger. You just redefine these. And these UKs that we had introduced ad hoc earlier enter here. You, you know, this, is, this is the meaning of you know, this is the new form of these are the coefficients. They are the same thing as we have written here, except they they're arrive, you know, they enter the picture through this operator transformation. You go from CK dagger CK, which are pure fermion electron operators, to gammas, uh, which are uh, uh, combinations of uh, creation and annihilation operators of electrons. They're not just creation or just annihilation of fermion. They are combination, linear combination. And these UK and VKs are the coefficients of that linear co combination. There are only two. And you get exactly the same uh, relations. UK square plus VK square will be equal to 1 from here it's a linear it's a you know transform from one operator space to another so it's a unitary thing so whatever you multiply it you can think of it as a matrix to this this and gamma k and gamma minus this. so you, the, you are, these are just the four matrix you know two by two matrix elements and it has a unitary term so uk squared you know plus vk squared will be one anyway so that's uh, once you do that uh, into this operator it converts this ck dagger in, into into something like this and now this is really in the oscillator formalism. You know, basically, it looks this term now looks exactly like the, just the first term. There's nothing left here. No. So, and whatever sits out in front is your allowed eigenvalues of the system now. Whatever sits there. Okay. And this is a very standard technique. You can apply it to any problem uh, uh, as long as you are able to uh, uh, bilinearize your Hamiltonian. You are good. You you found your new eigenvalues and uh, these are new quasi particles and it could be composed of electrons and phonons electrons and some spin wave electrons and light that will be exciton and and this is a you know uh, some combination of cooper pairs you know, that that's what it is here but this is the energy dispersion for the for the uh, uh, for the problem and that's exactly the same as you might get from the energy minimization picture oh, I didn't write that here I guess Anyway, so this is no, no different from what you get from the energy minimization picture. Yeah. What is the subscript BDG? Oh yeah, so uh, I, uh, so BDG. So B is for uh, B uh, Bogolyubov, the person who actually, and DG is uh, uh, Pierre Dijen. Uh, he's another physicist who they they kind of together were able to write it this way. It's just the name of people who, uh, you know. So if this this has BCS, that's Bogolyubov Dijen. You know. Uh, he was a French physicist uh, who did some very uh, pioneering work in superconductivity. He wrote a very early book as well on that. So, yeah. What was the argument for switching from Q indexing over Q to indexing over K in the 
third line? <laughs> oh, here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, actually a good question. So uh, you, you don't have to you know, switch it here. You can write it as Q, except that once you group it like that, and you know, you're summing, the thing is, it's, it's a re-index thing. You know, you just okay. K or Q, whichever you choose, once you re-index it like that. You know? okay. uh, but if you didn't, then you, might, you must maintain all these things. You okay. know? So yeah, you, uh, but if you choose that this is a, uh, it's an operator for, uh, if you're going to switch over from operators to numbers, right? so that's what you do here. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so uh, and, and uh, that being said, uh, what, what, what does this really mean then? Uh, it means that if I have a superconductor now, uh, and I'm trying to uh, look at the sp spectrum of, uh, uh, you know, if, if I have a certain energy or a certain k, and I'm trying to create Cooper pairs, and all, this is the energy it costs me. That's the physical meaning of it. This is the cost of energy to create a Cooper pair at or with a k momentum k. And now you see physically what is it trying to say that if I had not a, if I didn't have a superconductor, my gap would be zero. Let's say there's no superconducting gap. Then at if my energy is right at the Fermi level, I can excite an electron from the Fermi level to slightly above it with zero cost in energy, no problem, right? And that's 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 exactly there's you know if it would be a normal metal situation if there's no gap, right? And and uh, I think there's a yeah this is a picture okay. So this is the energy cost for you to excite. Uh, an electron in a normal metal, a normal metal at zero k Fermi level is uh, Fermi level is here, a Fermi wave vector is here, all states are occupied. And then if you want to just pull an electron from here to the above the Fermi energy, you have no energy cost at all. It, it costs zero energy. But if you want to pull an electron from here, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, you, 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 you want to conserve, so if you want to pull out an electron from here and put it there, for example, if you want to excite that hole, this is the energy cost, you know, Fermi energy minus that. Whereas if you want to put an electron here, uh, you know, this again. So you can see the excitation spectrum would look something like that. That energy, this energy. So uh, if you are right at the Fermi surface, there's no cost at energy. If you are very deep inside the Fermi uh, uh, surface, uh, you, you must pay the entire cost, meaning Physically, what I'm trying to say, if I, if I want to excite an electron that, at the center, I need the entire Fermi energy, because everything is blocked till there, right? I need the entire Fermi energy. But if I'm very close to the surface, I need very small energy to excite it, right? And that's the picture. So this will basically go up all the way to the Fermi energy by the time you're very deep inside the material. So that's the excitation spectrum for a Fermi function. But when it goes superconducting, something very interesting has happened now, uh, because we have excitation energy cost of delta, there's a gap now. It's a gap, and uh, so at very low case, uh, this was energy cost, but now, even if you are right at the Fermi surface, you have a price to, energy price to pay, and that price is because of the pairing and all that of electrons, you know, that, that's pro preventing you from creating a free particle excitation now. Okay? And, and then this is the meaning of the gap, and your, uh, it goes from zero to this small value, which is just about a milli electron volt or so, right? And uh, in, in, a, you know, in, in a superconductor with relatively low TCs. <coughs> and uh, the rest of it looks very similar. And if you look at this wind region here, this is the expression for it. This is the meaning of the energy spectrum of excitation. Okay. And uh, yeah, and it's very close to this. It's pretty much symmetric. And very far away from here, it's not of much interest because you are only looking at about a Debye, Debye energy around the Fermi, Fermi surface, right? So, and uh, so one of the problems I've asked you to do in this current assignment is to think of a uh, transition between a superconducting state to a metallic state and to find what is the maximum current, e electrical transport current, you can push through it, right? And uh, there are many ways to look at it. A very simple way to say is when I change a superconductor into a normal metal, uh, if, you know, uh, if you remember, the way we had looked at current earlier was you know, if I have uh, states occupied at no voltage, and then I apply voltage, it shifts like that, right? I have more right-going carriers than left-going carriers. Do you remember that part, right? And as a result, you can think of it as either K or in energy, right? It will shift, right? right? 
But if a superconductor is carrying current, it is actually already kind of shifted. Uh, let me put it this way. If it's a metal, uh, the, the, what, what, what a superconductor is doing, it's, it puts a gap at the surface, you know, at the Fermi surface. Right? And then if you want to push too much current and the shift is larger than the gap, then you convert into a normal metal again. But till you do that, that current, you know, there's a certain amount of current that can flow with this band, with this excitation spectrum. But if you exceed it, if your highest energy electrons exceed the gap, right, uh, then it can scatter now. The gap is saying that uh, in a superconductor, um, the, so in a normal metal, it shifts and the transport occurs because these electrons can kind of scatter here and then it's kind of do that. In a superconductor, it's blocked. There's, there's a gap now. Right? So, so you can use that to get a very, you know, in, in, uh, in a very easy way that the current density, maximum current density that you should be able to push through a superconductor would be off the order of, you know, 5 to 10 mega amp per centimeter square, 10 to the power 7 amps per centimeter square, off the order of that, you know. So that's the critical current of a superconductor. And you can, you know, essentially it's related to the gap, of course. I mean, if there's no gap, it's a normal metal, too. And that is also related to the other critical quantities, which is what is the maximum critical field or, you know, mag magnetization and, and to TC. All of them are related. And all of them are related to the gap, as you can see, right? So, uh, what else did I want to say here? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, so I trust you are going to be able to work through some of these steps and uh, hopefully it will be uh, useful to see uh, how that works out as well. Uh, this delta, the gap, uh, uh, when, you, when it's experimentally measured, uh, the delta, uh, or rather what happens also, one way to look at uh, the superconducting transition is at the lowest temperatures, the delta is, you know, whatever value it is, roughly one or, you know, well, one MeV or, or of that order, but as you increase temperature, the gap actually changes and it vanishes at your critical temperature. Above it, there's no gap; it's a normal metal. So, and this expression for it, you know, how does delta change with temperature, can also be obtained by either you know the, this uh, Bogolyubov approach or, or operator approach or the full you know, or, or the BCS approach. Both of them can give you the temperature dependence of the gap of the superconductor. Uh, and that is clearly related, you might imagine, to you know uh, the uh, competition between the you know the uh, VK square and the Fermi function. This is a competition between the normal metal and the superconducting phases. And uh, uh, what you get really is is this self-consistency equation that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, you know uh, gotten to with the Cooper pair problem. Here, you also have a Fermi function that will enter, which, which has a temperature dependence in, in this window. And that will, you know, once you solve this with that Fermi function inside here, uh, you will get this expression. And that's what BCS theory also showed. You can show the temperature dependence uh, and how it closes as you increase the temperature. Uh, and then essentially, the, uh, it appears in this, this, this picture because there are some carriers which are normal you know, not superconducting, and they're, they're, they're following the Fermi-Dirac function, and there's a competition between the two kinds. So, yeah, was that a question? No, okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, I wanted to um, kind of uh, kind of end the discussion now on, on the, the theory of superconducting. It's obviously a very rich uh, theory, and as you all know, it is incomplete. You know, there's uh, high TC, there's uh, microscopic reasons for high TC is still being hotly debated and some beautiful experiments being done around the world and also in uh, as Shimas Davis's group, they're doing tunneling spectroscopy to look at the, you know, the uh, gap and gap spectrum and all that sort of thing. Uh, <coughs> and uh, some theories are being, it looks like spin has a role to play in that, you know, and, and uh, antiferromagnetic ordering and that's, such things. So it's a very rich subject at the same time. And I think it's actually pretty amazing how uh, if you uh, think of this, you know, this microscopic picture is responsible, for example, for not just persistent conductivity, but you have probably have seen videos of, you know, a superconductor being suspended on top of a magnet 
you know, and uh, uh, so you know the collective effort of you know this large number of Cooper pairs and the flux quantization and flux trapping is able to uh, you know uh, from the electrons you can see the transport of electrons and combination of you know and coherence of electrons is able to uh, you know from a microscopic picture you know elevate small particles or trains or, or big objects and it is actually pretty incredible to me how powerful this thing is right uh, and not just that i mean we know that all electric trains are running on electron transport too you know i mean so electron transport leads to mechanical transport on a grand scale and many you know many other things uh, and superconductivity is of course uh, uh, I mean, the ideas that were developed here apply to a wide range of other fields, uh, you know, neutron stars in astronomy and uh, liquid helium, superfluidity, uh, and, and, and many other areas as well. Right? So the basic idea is if there is any chance for electrons, see if the, you have free electrons, if you have two electrons in complete vacuum, they can never attract. They'll always repel. So it is the fact that they are in, put in a situation like in a crystal or something where it can there are opportunities for it to find ways to attract or to have a pairing potential the moment you have even a slight amount of pairing potential it is their inevitable fate that they're going to form a you know a condensate like that they will have a lower energy they can lower their energy by pairing up you know and then that's very interesting and uh, uh, i think i'm I'm, what I'm absolutely sure of, this is we haven't seen the last of it. You know, there will be a lot of other exciting discoveries uh, with this, with the, with you know, based on this idea. And uh, uh, I had mentioned that, uh, for example, uh, the uh, Josephson junctions. Uh, they're they're finding you know uses in many uh, you know MRIs and uh, Josephson junctions and for qubits and uh, very sensitive uh, because. The current is, uh, because of flux quantization around rings, it can measure magnetic fields which are uh, down to the flux quantum, right? So it can measure tiny signals of the brain and all in an MRI and all kinds of things. So it's, uh, uh, it has a very wide usage. I've asked you to also, you know, uh, uh, solve that problem, right, uh, of uh, the Josephson junction. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, this is also uh, capable of, uh, producing, you know, very high-speed oscillations with the DC input. At the same time, uh, if you take one junction and, you know, form two, uh, that's your squid magnetometer. So how many magnetic flux? So uh, these are the uses. Uh, people are uh, already kind of these are being implemented now for qubits and all those. So essentially, uh, the main message is a, uh, a large superconductor, macroscopic superconductor, not just you know uh, on a chip, but extending many, many miles is behaving just like one atom. That's the key. It's one big quantum object. So you can see quantum mechanics at a grand scale, if you might, you know, so, so which is not limited to electrons inside a crystal. And, and uh, so this phenomena is able to show you that feature, which is why if I take two of them and I try to you know, big um, kind of almost m messy, you know, metal chunks, and then I put a little dielectric and I get, you know, this behavior. These are not individual atoms. These are, you know, collection of huge condensed matter systems with lots of electrons, but they're behaving like individual atoms, which are coupled to each other, you know, like macroscopically ordered system. You know, so, okay, good. So, uh, and and that's really the reason they are uh, also being looked at very carefully for, uh, qu you know, qubits, uh, qu quantum bits, because there you want to use interaction between quantum states to do computation for quantum communications and, and you know where you're uh, guaranteed secure secure communications uh, so that they're also being looked at for that purpose okay good so uh, I went through this part a little fast but uh, I'm kind of uh, offloading my job to your in your assignment uh, but uh, I think you hopefully you know uh, enjoy doing it and then uh, if you need help please uh, also let me know about that okay any last questions on this topic for this class of course again yeah this might yeah. be a little off topic but sure. has superconductivity been realized in like a, a fake crystal structure if it's like um, in, a, yeah. in a cold atom system where Good. atoms are loaded into an optical 
It's actually a great question. Uh, so another parallel uh, development that has occurred is uh, formation of Bose-Einstein condensates, BECs. You know, so, and there, you know, you you, you can take uh, bosonic atoms, you know, which are like helium three uh, or or sodium. I mean, some of these atoms which have no net spin, and you can create conditions for them using light trapping or other means or other techniques. That's, that's that there you can control how. Uh, just like the pairing interaction between electrons here, you know that solids condense because there's van der Waal interaction between two atoms. That's the reason they condense too. It's very similar, you know, condensation into a, you know, from a, or, or from gas to liquid or liquid to solid. It's all, all the same. These few phenomena are same. Here it's just electrons which are in a liquid-like state or a gas-like state in a Fermi normal metal into a superconductor, which is more like a, you know, correlated so liquid or solid. Meaning it has gained rigidity. Right? You, you you cannot uh, uh, probably a liquid to a solid is the best uh, analogy. Right? Now, if you want to move it, you have to move the whole thing. You, know, there, you can't do just parts of it now, right? So, in uh, in uh, atomic systems, uh, the Bose-Einstein condensates they, because of you know you can control how far at, uh, apart the atoms are using light trapping. You can control exactly what is the strength of their coupling. So you yeah, can tune it now. And there you can take it into situations where you, you will kind of create Bose-Einstein condensates by tuning this below a certain, you know, uh, once your in, uh, temperatures are low enough. You basically see a very similar feature. Uh, now, the Bose-Einstein condensate, on the other hand, is different because it's, it's made of bosons. It's not made of fermions. These are fermions. But then, if you look at the two mechanisms, there are a lot of similarities. So there is a whole field. I mean, there's a very active. It's called the BEC, which is the Bose-Einstein concept slash BCS, or it's a crossover between BEC and BCS. And they are using ideas from there to do things in the Bose-Einstein concepts. And they're using, of course, ideas from Bose-Einstein concepts to do something BC. So there's connection, very strong connection between the atomic and molecular and you know, AMO sort of areas with the condensed matter analog here, very, very much, very much. Yeah. <coughs> in fact, uh, uh, they can do some very nice things that you cannot do in a solid state. You know, if you if you have a series of atoms, they can go in and you know with the laser pulse excite just one of the sites, you know, which is very difficult to do in a solid because they're all you know very strong tight. But then you can selectively excite one site and see how the you know, coupling changes and all the waves propagate in these atomic systems. Typically, that's quite a bit lower temperature than these, actually, you know, than, than the few Kelvins here, but it actually works. Okay, good. So uh, I, I want to uh, end this discussion at this point. Uh, uh, but one thing I wanted to kind of uh, uh, re remind uh, you is uh, I had mentioned that uh, the frequency that uh, that appears here in this Josephson junction is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, now the use for the standard of voltage because it's related to, you know, the frequency over the voltage is ratio of fundamental constants, E and H bar. Right? So it's extremely precise in one part in 10 to the power 12 or something like that, right? So very, very precise quantity, and this is now the standard for voltage. Uh, and such uh, precision. Uh, of the order of 10 to the power minus 12, you know, one part in 100 billion, what is it? something like that, is is very rare in condensed matter systems or solid state systems, extremely rare. You know. uh, flux quantization, very precise. Uh, frequency locking to the voltage, extremely precise. You know. And uh, uh, the third uh, property, which is extremely precise in condensed matter systems, is our next topic, you know, which is the uh, it's, it's called the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, but uh, that is our excuse to get into to, to topological stuff, and it, we'll use that to understand it. And so I'll first explain what it is experimentally. And this also came as a big surprise. Uh, people were, it's not like people were not expecting integer quantum Hall effect to show up, but what was the biggest surprise is uh, you're measuring a resistance that was precise, independent of materials, independent of what sort of device you made, to one part in a billion or more, something like that. You know. And that's a resistance, you know, R in ohms that you are measuring. That, that is extremely precise at a particular value. Uh, and, and that happens 
uh, in a semiconductor you know, in a, with no correlations uh, and, and it happens because of some very interesting, it's not a many particle effect is what I wanted to say. It's a single particle effect. You know. uh, question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's uh, I'll skip over a few things here. We, uh, I'll go here. Uh, spin. Did I talk about spin? No, maybe later. I'll talk about spin later. So I'll go back to something we've talked about earlier. We did a lot of work on scattering and all that, and, and so, so how to calculate scattering rates. Uh, and I pointed out to you how one do, does it in a two-dimensional electron system. All that changes is your wave functions. If you want to find scattering rates, use 2D electron gas wave functions. You know, two of the coordinates, kx and ky, the electron is free to move in two directions, but it's quantized in the third direction, so you get a you know, z part that's quantized and xy is free. And uh, you know, some details, uh, there's some shape of the wave functions. It could be triangular, it could be graphene-like, you know, all electrons in one sheet, or it could be you know, in silicon MOSFET where it's uh, silicon dioxide and silicon or you know, dielectric, and then you have a triangular well. Doesn't matter exactly. Uh, it matters exactly what shape it is on, on some of these exact you know, calculations, but in the end, the physical phenomena is somewhat independent of the exact shape of the wave functions in a 2D system. Just want to kind of recalibrate with 2D systems for a second. And uh, you can use it to calculate mobilities and all that. I'll, I'll skip this and go here. Okay, so, uh, so electron mobility, uh, you, you did uh, work, uh, work through this part. You saw in bulk materials, it, it, it will go up and then it comes down because of impurity scattering and high temperatures are due to phonon scattering. Right? By the way, these phonons, the polar optical phonons, are exactly the same phonons that lead to uh, you know, the coupling here in the BCS theory, at least. And there's a Froelich you know, polar optical phonon coupling is the same one. You know? Uh, so, uh, uh, and you can see that, you know, the mobilities you can reach maybe about 100,000 at certain temperatures here, even in bulk material if you are extremely clean and low, do low background doping and all that. Now, if you go to, this is bulk or three-dimensional, the electrons are free to move in all three directions. But now, if you, if you go into this sort of a 2D structure, either in a sheet of 2D material or in a quantum well, right, then, uh, then our mobilities, oh, sorry about that, yeah. The mobilities uh, go way higher uh, because you can remove the impurities from the path of the electrons. You, know, you can spatially separate them. Uh, and uh, uh, so the mobilities here are you know, basically uh, reaching, and this is only at very, very low temperature. At room temperature, it's not much of, of a change because the phonons are still dominating the scattering rates. You know. Uh, this is gallium arsenide. At room temperature, you get about uh, maybe 8,000 or something like that. And here, too, you get about 8,000 in 3D. But at low temperatures, uh, because you have moved the impurities far away from the path of the electrons, this thing kind of keeps climbing you know, and goes higher and higher. And uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, people were able to achieve, uh, let's see, 50, 50 million or something like that, you know, 50 million, uh, 36 million. So that, you know, if you do the numbers, uh, that's the mobility, and from the mobility you can find your mean free path and all that sort of thing, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, velocity times the electric field is, uh, sorry, uh, velocity is mobility times electric field, right? And uh, from, and velocity times some scattering rate is your mean free path of electrons, right? So from here you can see that uh, uh, the, Mobility determines the mean free path. If higher is the mobility, of course, I mean, the, the less is the scattering and the mean free path is longer. But uh, essentially, once you get into this sort of high mobility regimes, uh, your mean free path becomes, you know, almost uh, millimeters, you know, which is, you know, but, and, and today we can easily fabricate structures which are, you know, 10 or 100 micron long. So the electrons would go through, if you are placed them at this temperature, they would go through the, you know, semiconductor with not a single scattering event. That, that's the idea. Statistically, I mean, there will be probably some, but uh, uh, so it's essentially they are behaving as if there are free electrons in vacuum. There's no, there are no atoms in the way. That's how they're behaving. Now, right? uh, if you go get into the very high mobility structures, and uh, uh, in in some of uh, and uh, if you now take these electron gases and you start applying, you do the transport measurement and you measure resistance and all that at very high magnetic fields. You start applying magnetic field now. So then uh, some interesting things start happening. Uh, if I do that for a 3D system like this, if I do a 3D system and apply a large magnetic field, you know, the density of states of a 3D which goes as square root of energy, 
uh, you know that in <coughs> Uh, if I have electrons that are free to move in three directions, uh, in x, y, and z, and I apply a very large magnetic field, okay, uh, uh, then even from classical physics, you know that uh, the electrons uh, want to do circles around the magnetic field, right? They, they want to do cyclotron orbits right? from Lorentz force picture, right? Uh, so uh, you can think of it as uh, uh, that uh, the if you apply the magnetic field in the z direction, then uh, what the magnetic field is doing is it's trying to freeze the motion in the other two directions, in the perpendicular to it. So, and larger is the field, the you know uh, more strongly uh, you know circular the orbits are, or rather they, they you know they 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 uh, the cyclotron orbits become stronger if you might. And so what it's really trying to do is it's freezing out two degrees of freedom. Initially, it was free to move in z, x, and y, but because of the magnetic field now, it has a very hard time moving in x and y, or translating in x and y, because it's just doing circles now, right? It's not able to drift easily. Does that make sense? I mean, so it's freezing out two degrees of freedom. So if I start from a three-dimensional density of states, uh, if at a very large magnetic field, what it will do is it will change the density of states here. Okay. Uh, change the density of states from a 3D look like to a 1D like because there's a minus two dimensions you know, in, in, in the density of states. Right? And when you work through the quantum mechanics of it, you get that you know, the, uh, if your energy uh, before you apply the magnetic field was kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared, right? By twice the effective mass, say, in the conduction band. Uh, once you apply the very large field, uh, the energies now will look like the following. So if you're field is along z, the electron can still, even though it's doing circles, it can still move around uh, along the z direction. It has no restriction. So the energy, you can uh, write it as kz squared is still free electron in that direction. Does that make sense? The kz is not altered because of the magnetic field, but the x and y are severely altered now. And what happens at you know, uh, fields is uh, you, it, it gets quantized. It gets quantized to h bar omega c, where omega is the cyclotron frequency. Uh, magnetic electron charge, magnetic field, effective mass of the band, the electrons. So you froze out these two degrees of freedom, and you condense them into the quantized number of harmonic oscillator-like states. So n is the uh, quantum number here. Right? So, or a quantum number, I mean, that's a fancy term. Essentially, what it really means is uh, you know, if I take this uh, density of states and I slice it up into windows of h bar omega c, what it does is it takes these states and it bunches them up and it makes them, you know, it will, uh, it will look like a quasi 1D system, so it will kind of start looking something like this, and a 1D system looks like that. This thing will look like that, this thing will look like that, and the sort of the, uh, uh, you know, it will still behave like this, I mean, the, the whole trend, but the density of states is now 1D. Does that. I'm not deriving this for you, but uh, just to point it, point it out, what, it needs, what you need to do here is make this change of operators, remember, uh, del uh, plus electron charge times the vector potential. That, the moment you do that, you'll get this in a two, two, you know, few steps from it. And the wave functions, uh, so this is the eigenvalues in the presence of a magnetic field. The wave functions were, of course, free electrons here, right? All, all three directions were free. Here it will become, it's still free in the z direction, but the x, y direction will become, you know, Hermit polynomials so that are the harmonic oscillator thing, right? So Hermit polynomial in the y and uh, x, and with some quantum number n that goes here. This gives you that. So it looks like this. And some linear combinations of these and, and details like that. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. So the wave, I mean, this, I've not written it exactly, but the wave function in the presence of a magnetic field will look like that. And there'll be some, you know, some sort of magnetic lengths here which depend on the magnetic field strength and such things. But the x part remains free. It's free to move in the x direction. You know, so. 
uh, if, uh, sorry, the z part remains free because the magnetic field is in the z direction. Okay. And does this event occur um, anytime you perturb the magnetic field? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This will the density of states reordering always happens. What physically, uh, you, uh, you know, at room temperature, typically it would be difficult to see it because, you know, the there are two things. One is there's some disorder which leads to some sort of you know broadening here. It's not quite very precise. And the second is then there is uh, KT at room temperature which washes out some of these details because this energy separation may, may be much smaller than room temperature KT. But if you take it to low temperatures, here's an experimental data for example. This is in a 3D electron gas inside a semiconductor, not even a metal. And the, uh, what we're doing is measuring just plain resistance between two contacts flowing through a 3D semiconductor. And uh, uh, what we observe is the resistance will start oscillating like that uh, as a function of magnetic field. But here it's plotted as a function of 1 over magnetic field. You know? And this was observed in uh, you know, late 1920s, uh, right after people are able to go to low temperatures. It's called the Shubnikov you know, de-Haas oscillations, because after the people who measured it in metals first. You can see it in semiconductors and pretty much you know, all, all, all situations where you have a decent enough transport and not too much scattering. What does scattering do? It, it kind of messes up a little bit here. If you are not able to complete orbits and you scatter here before that, then, then you mess this up. You know. So as long as the scattering is not frequent enough that you can close orbits, these features show up experimentally. Does that make sense? I mean, and you can calculate almost classically at what magnetic field I should get these oscillations to show up. And if you look carefully, the units of mobility and magnetic field are such that you know this thing is dimensionless. Uh, units of mobility are also 1 over Tesla, if you want to express it that way. So whenever your mobility times magnetic field is much greater than 1, uh, you can get these oscillations. Basically, you, you, you don't scatter too often. You can complete orbits, uh, oscillation. So either you go to very high magnetic fields with low mobility, or if you have you know restriction on magnetic fields, which you typically have, you go to high mobility to see it. So this is a restriction. Uh, order of magnitude, uh, mobility. Uh, so essentially, uh, at 10 Tesla a magnetic uh, magnetic field, uh, you need a mobility of uh, uh, a, t uh, a thousand centimeter square per volt second. You can do the numbers here. So if you are a million, you are way above it. No problem. Yeah. So this was measured in a sample that had mobility of, I forget, 1,500 or 2,000 or something like that at room temperature and also at low temperatures, but it shows up. Of course, mass and other things matter too. OK, so that's uh, just a, this is not the quantum Hall effect, but it's just a pre precursor of the quantum Hall effect. This had been observed all the way you know, uh, since 1920s uh, till the quantum Hall effect showed up. And the quantum Hall effect uh, is the following. Oh, it is not working here. Uh, so now, instead of a 3D system, I take a 2D system, 2D electron gas, like in a silicon MOSFET or in a 2D material or graphene. right? And in a 2D system, what's different is the density of states is actually constant right, in a 2D system. So now, if I do the same business again, I apply a large magnetic field perpendicular to the 2D plane, perpendicular. Then it went from 2D to 0D, right? 0D. And 0D meaning it takes slices of h bar omega c and just bunches them up, and you get a delta function, delta function, delta function. So basically, it collapses all these states into that state now, separated by the cyclotron frequency. So now you have created a system with a magnetic field. This is the density of states, by the way, right? With energy. So this looks, it's a quantum dot. It's basically like an atomic system. It has discrete allowed energies now. But what is different from a dot is this energy has a large number of degeneracy. It can hold a lot of electrons. It's not just two. Right? It's a heavily degenerate system and hold a lot. But what is interesting is now you have gaps between the density of states, of gaps. Whereas in the 3D system, you didn't have gaps. When you measure the conductivity, why does it oscillate? It's very simple to think. I mean, uh, remember, m m conductivity is proportional to the density of states. This is from Fermi golden rule, straight, you know, straight from there, right? 
and your scattering rate depends on the density of states and all that. So if you have larger number of states, you can, you know, basically, if you have no states, there's no conductivity, right? I mean, it's a gap. So if your Fermi level is, and as you change the magnetic field, what you're doing is you're sweeping the separation here. And so the number of states at the Fermi level, which is basically this height, is oscillating as you're sweeping the field out. And as a result, the resistances or the conductivity and the resistance, all of them are oscillating, right? Because of that, yeah. But now you have gaps, right? Uh, in the 2D system, if you not in 3, but in 2D, you have gaps. So now again, we're going to do the same thing. And uh, so experimentally, what was seen uh, in 1980 uh, was the following. This is extremely strange. You know. uh, if I'm at a very low magnetic field, uh, what is plotted here is both, you know, the longitudinal resistance, you know, Rxx, meaning you're applying current, you know, in this direction, and you're measuring the voltage drop in this direction. But you also know, you know, in 19, uh, sorry, 1890 or 1880, Edwin Hall had found that if I push current, uh, you know, this way, and apply magnetic field this way, then the voltage develops that way because the electrons are, you know, Lorentz, you know, and that's the standard Hall effect. Standard Hall effect tells you that if I measure Rxy, which is the transverse resistance, it's linear with the magnetic field. Right? And it is indeed very linear at very small magnetic fields. And the longitudinal resistance really shouldn't depend much on magnetic field, it should be constant. And you know, there's some amount of magnetic resistance because of other effects, but it shouldn't change much. Right? But here's what happens in the 2D system uh, in the quantum Hall effect. As you ramp up the magnetic field, the longitudinal resistance, that's you know, the resistance along the direction of current flow, uh, starts uh, developing these steps, these steps here. Right? And these steps are exactly at uh, h over e square times an integer, uh, or what over integer? The conductance is in integer, so resistance is in h over e square, which is Planck's constant over electron charge square. Uh, uh, and, and, and then there's an integer, this is integer is 1, this is integer is 2, integer is 3, 4, 5, and so on. So this is the longitudinal, sorry, this is the uh, Hall resistance, the transverse in Rxy. And what is even more astonishing is the Rxx, which is the longitudinal resistance, you know, starts oscillating, but I think you know that if you have oscillation that's at, whose amplitude is increasing and its DC value is here, sooner or later you're going to hit zero, right? right? And indeed, the resistance seems to vanish for current, you know, if you're, current, if you're looking at the resistance in this way, I over V in this direction, then the resistance seems to vanish here. And it's, it's, so one might think this is like a superconductor, right? There's no resistance in the flow of electrons. Right? Uh, first of all, two things. Uh, so this value is what I meant to say is extremely precise, meaning you can do it in gallium arsenide, in silicon, gallium nitride, 2D materials, graphene. No matter which one you choose, you get the same value, exact same resistance in all independent of materials. You know? and, 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 that's, and the precision here is in part of in a billion, so it's extremely high as well, it's very high precision. Uh, and that indicates that there must be some connection to this, you know, um, for example, flux quantization and, and, and things like that. Uh, and, and indeed there is, and, and that's what we kind of were trying to motivate at this point. And we'll see that the conductance, which is 1 over the Rxy here, is related to e squared by h times an integer. And this integer is what's called the churn number or an invariant. Uh, basically, uh, it's related to the Berry phase, and we're going to see that. It, it is forced to be an integer, uh, 3, 5, 10, whatever. It cannot assume any values in between integers. So. Uh, and uh, so maybe we'll end by just saying that uh, uh, this state is it superconductor because now it's a semiconductor and I have zero resistance in the longitudinal state. So you can ask whether it's a superconductor. Uh, the picture though is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you look at classically what's going on is as, as you apply a large magnetic field, there are states that are deep inside the bulk of the material and they're just doing circles. Uh, and uh, they are uh, kind of not really contributing to uh, the transport. Whereas there are states that are at the edges that are skipping, you know, essentially they would do something like that. So they are able to skip along and move in this direction at the edges. These are called the edge states. We are going to look at that in quite some detail. 
And, and as a result of the magnetic field, what, what's going on there is the states are kind of getting pushed out to the edges, the ones that can conduct current. The states are still there inside, but they're essentially like atoms. They're insulating. They're not conducting much current here. So the question is, is this really a superconductor? Uh, and, uh, and these are really because of states that are not at the edge, in fact. And if you look at it carefully, uh, 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 what, what we'll find is uh, um, so superconductor, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a little more detail. We'll see that this is actually not, not, not superconductor, but it doesn't show any of the hallmarks of superconductivity. Then he said, well, uh, let's step down. Is it a metal? And we'll see it's actually not even a metal. You know, it's actually an insulator. Uh, and which is very weird, and the reason for that is very interesting. That the conductivity here is a tensor; it's not not you know, not a isotropic quantity. And if you write current along x and current along y as due to due to electric field along x and electric field due to y, there are four components to the conductivity. Okay, and uh, you can write your conductivity as the inverse of the resistivity matrix like that. And for these plateaus, the quantum Hall plateaus. This, this is the Rx, x, or the longitudinal value. And uh, uh, you know, if Rx, x, or rho x, s, which is the resistivity, is 0, and rho y, y, which is also 0, basically we're saying if these, these values are 0, it defines that the conductivity is actually 0. It's not infinity. You know, because of this formula here, you can see if, if these two are 0, then uh, conductivity is 0. Uh, the transverse ones are not zero, so it doesn't blow up. So anyway, this is an insulator. But what is very interesting about this system is with the magnetic field, you are transitioning this system from uh, what looks like a normal metal, where you have Hall resistance and you have a, you know, some, some finite resistivity, to an insulator, metal, insulator, metal, and you're going through these transitions with the magnetic field. So you, with the magnetic field, you can switch the system from a metallic state to a quantum Hall insulator state to a metallic state, and so on. And uh, so we'll use this picture in the next class to uh, continue and uh, look at where does the quantization come in. And that's why we'll need this idea of the Berry phase, which will immediately give us what is that quantum number that's sitting there, and why is it that it is so precise? It will give us those answers right away. Okay. OK, so I'm done for today. Uh, so next week, uh, we have no classes. You have seen the calendar, probably, uh, both classes. But I will send you, uh, a, so please work on your homeworks and also your projects, uh, right? You have uh, hopefully been continuing to work on that. The other thing I want to say is uh, I won't have too much time to talk about spin in, in particular in this class. But the, I would like you to, perhaps next week, watch one of the you know, recorded uh, videos of uh, the class that, were that was taught last time where we talked about the origin of spin and how, because that, that may prove a little useful for the next few classes. You know? So I just suggest you to watch the video and just, and, and it may help you also with the last problem of the current assignments. Okay, good. Uh, question? Um, so we won't have I think we have, uh, I planned that it's made up already. Yeah. You have all the Fridays you have been meeting. If you think that's a normal class day, that's great for me, but Fridays <laughs> have been extra classes. You know? So I think we made it made up already.